Hi everyone, welcome to a new video series that I'm doing uh, that I'm titling Kubernetes Development with BPF. So in this series, uh, of which this is episode zero, we will be setting up a Kubernetes self-hosted development environment for BTF and BPF learning uh, and discovery of uh, various technologies about Kubernetes. My name is Michael Mullen and let's get started. So what is this all about? Well, the end result of what I'm about to show you is that I am going to set up a cluster of Firecracker-based virtual machines. All of these virtual machines will be hosted on a Linux PC uh, that I'm running and running right now. Um, all of the uh, virtual machines will be hosted inside of an isolated virtual network namespace. And the reason why I'm doing that is to be able to control the IP addresses of each of these virtual machines, which could be important if you're working in a, um, a business environment. And what we'll be running here is three Kubernetes worker nodes, one Kubernetes master, and one private Docker registry. These worker nodes, the, the Kubernetes worker nodes, will each have a pod which scrapes exec VE calls on its uh, various virtual machines. Um, and it stores these calls until a viewer goes to a website that is hosted on these nodes. So let me give you a, a demo of what the final product is going to be. And I'm going to be fast forwarding some of the uh, um, the setup here because it does take a, a quite a while to actually do this setup. So let me let me run the demo for you, and you can see what I'm what I'm talking about here. So I am going to create a network namespace called test and enter into it, and from that I am going to start a cluster of Ubuntu virtual machines. I am now going to start up um, all of the Kubernetes and a Docker um, private repository on, of the, on the virtual machines that I've just started up running. All right, now that the uh, Kubernetes cluster is up and running, I am going to go into my um, Docker, uh, Docker image uh, area. I'm going to make sure that my, the image that I'm about to create is uh, from a clean repository. And then I am going to build a Docker container or an OCI compliant container that we will eventually put inside of that Kubernetes cluster that we just made. All right, and that was really fast because I've already done this before. Um, and then I am going to push that up into the private um, Docker repository that we uh, created while we were creating the Kubernetes, Kubernetes cluster. I'm then going to copy into the master, um, the master Kubernetes um, virtual machine, the uh, Kubernetes um, configuration that will get the, uh, the image that we just created up and running. So I'm going to secure copy. Uh, I'll then SSH into the master machine and check out the, the, the cluster a little bit before I run the, uh, the, um, the configuration. So let's see what um, pods we have. We don't have any pods in the default namespace, but we have a bunch of pods running um, in the cluster. So we've got Cilium running, we've got Istio running, and we've also got MetalDB running as a service. Um, or we will have MetalDB running as soon as we, we initiate it. So let's initiate the, the configuration for the, uh, 
the the BPF scraper that we've just we've just uploaded to the private repository. So I'm going to cube control apply dash F. And let's watch those pods be created. And it looks like we've got them all running there. Let's just check one more time. So we've got all of these cell apps, which is the, the name of the, the BPF uh, exec VE scraper. So they're all up and running. So let's see what we get out of those pods. So I'm going to go over here into Firefox and go into the load balancer for this cluster. And we see that we've got a list of exec VE calls that are being run on this node. And if we refresh, because it's a load balancer, we'll see the next node and we'll see a list of um, uh, exec VE calls that are being run and we'll go to the next one and so on and so forth. So every time that we go to these nodes, the, the list of exec VE is cleared so that um, we don't kind of overrun too many things here. This is just a demonstration. So, so you can see things are being run here. So let's SSH into one of these nodes. And do a who am I and an LL and go back into Firefox and see if we can find that. Well, there's our who am I, and there's our LS. So awesome. On our uh, worker nodes, we are now scraping the exec VE calls that are being called on those nodes and um, giving them out as a web page for our viewing pleasure. So it seems rather simple, but there was a lot of work that went into that. So to answer the question of what's this all about, it's to get us to a state where we can start seeing things like this. So why are we doing it this way? Um, we're doing it this, this way because um, for learning purposes, we want absolute and full control over everything that we're doing. So the reasons why we want full and absolute control is uh, sometimes when you're in an organization, you may need to beg your upper management for cloud resources. Um, now, this begging might take weeks uh, to get um, permissions and approval from your upper management. You may be on a team that only has a single cloud, so you don't want to screw up that cloud because if you screw up the cloud for yourself, um, you screw up your cl the cloud for your team members. And also, a uh, cloud such as uh, AWS has costs associated associated with it. So if you make a mistake with, with what you've done, uh, it might harm your business's bottom line. It might cost a lot of money. Your mistake might cost a lot of money. So while you're making mistakes, and making mistakes is to be expected while you're learning, you don't want to cost your company like excess amount of uh, excess amounts of money while you're doing it. So the next right reason why we're doing, why we want absolute and full control is that the process that I'm about to show you, nothing is hidden here. Um, all of the learning that I'm, that, I've, that I'm about to demonstrate to you in this series is learning that I've gathered from how to set up a production ready environment from the Kubernetes IO website. And I'm also going to show you everything that got me up and up until being able to set up Kubernetes, such as uh, getting virtual machines up and running, getting kernels for those machines up and running, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so everything from the actual kernel config up into the actual um, YAML configurations for all of our Kubernetes pods, uh, you can learn that from this video series. Now, I'm not going to do a walkthrough of each individual line by line 
of the kernel config to the, um, the Kubernetes YAML files, but everything will be available to you in my GitHub repositories. Um, so your homework will be to go and look at the, uh, the information that I'm giving you in order to learn about what the things that you want to learn about. And the last reason why we want full and absolute control is to utilize available resources that are not cloud-based. So if you've got a, a Linux PC, you can use that Linux PC uh, to do all of this. Or if you've got a big on-premises development server, you can use that on-premises development server to do the things that I'm about to teach you. So what do you need to, to be able to follow along with me? You need a Linux host machine or a Linux server. Um, that Linux host machine needs to be running a relatively recent distribution. So um, I am running Arch. However, this should work fine on uh, Red Hat 8, Alma Linux 8, um, Ubuntu uh, 20.04, things like that. The, the one caveat to this is that you need to have a lot of RAM. You need at least 24 gigabytes of RAM on the machine that is running as host. And the reason for that is, let me show you how much RAM I am using uh, for this demonstration. You'll oh, I'm you actually need a little bit more than 24 gigabytes of RAM. So you'll see that um, now I am also running OBS and I'm running um, Firefox. So take that into account as you see this this 24.5 gigabytes of RAM being used. Uh, but you need you need a lot of RAM to, to be able to run this. So what are the other things that you need on this host machine? You need QEMU, you need Firecracker, and you need Docker. Uh, it would also be nice if you have Rust and that you're able to compile with Rust. Now it's technically not needed because we use Docker to do all of the code compilation for the demo purposes. However, if you want to test your code before um, uploading it into your Kubernetes cluster, it's nice to have uh, Rust up and running on your host machine. You'll also want the Linux kernel source code, and I will show you how to get that. And you will need a fast internet connection because you're going to be uh, downloading patches and stuff like that for your virtual machines. You'll also need uh, um, some distribution dependent packages if you intend on compiling your Rust code on your host machine for testing purposes. This is all documented in the uh, Docker file in order to make our uh, Docker image uh, that we did in this make build process. So it's all in this uh, Docker file here. It's all right here. Um, now this is for Alma Linux or Red Hat Linux or CentOS 8, uh, but you'll have to uh, know how to turn these dependencies into whatever your, your, uh, your distribution uses as the names of those, those dependencies. Um, you'll also probably want some helper utilities that I provide. So there's three um, GitHub repositories that I've put my code up into. I have some Kubernetes Ansible scripts to um, start up the, 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 um, the Kubernetes cluster. I have some virtual machine helper scripts to run all of the virtual machines that are being used. And I have a, um, a BTF image that has the Rust code that you compile in order to make that OCI compliant Docker image. You don't technically need any of these, um, but I will be using them and they are helpful to get you started. So, like I said, this is a series. Um, in episode one, I'll be demonstrating how to compile the kernel that you will need for each of your virtual machines. In episode two, I will go into describing how to set up each of these virtual machines that you will be using to run the, the Kubernetes cluster. In episode three, I'll demonstrate how to go about setting up that cluster. And in episode four, I'll demonstrate the building and the deploying and testing 
of the BTF, uh, the scraper, the execve scraper Docker image. So I'll see you in the next episode. Uh, thank you very much for watching.